wanted to mask too hard. <laughs> Got mask face. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to CFC again. Thank you again, Stephen, for doing announcements today. Um, sorry, I'm like trying to lock it so it doesn't just fly. Um, uh, today we have a guest speaker, um, our brother, our good friend Gabe, Pastor Gabe, um, is from a local San Jose church. He's the director of discipleship and connections, uh, and a, a close friend of mine in seminary. And you know, one thing we don't realize when we go into ministry is the importance of having um, fellow shepherds and friends to walk with. Um, you know, you think you kind of do it yourself, and it's kind of very dangerous place to be, especially in ministry. And Gabe and I have been friends through seminary. I think we're just buddies through three, four years of school, and then um, have been able to journey for the last 10 years as, as, as fellow colleagues in the work. And so we've been able to go through each other's ups and downs, supporting each other, praying for each other, encouraging each other, challenging each other. And so I'm very excited to have him here to share. And when I asked him if you, if you would like to share um, with us, and we talk about it, um, I think the series, he was like, hey, I'd share from the series, support the flow of your thought process. So, and so he's gonna be preaching from First Samuel. Um, as part of our series, so it's really cool to have Gabe willing to do that for us. Um, Gabe's family's here. I think Gabe's wife, Lori, and their children in the back, and so you can say hi to Lori later and welcome them. And so with that said, I'm just going to have him come up, a good friend of mine, Brother Gabe, Pastor Gabe. Okay. Good morning. Um... It's fun. This is fun. Like, uh, I don't know if you guys know, if you guys are at home, you guys are watching this, but, you know, the sails and uh, in the shade, it's actually nice. It's, it's really fun, actually. I think you can have, like, barbecues and stuff like that out there. Um, I don't want to take credit for it, but it was, it was kind of my idea. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it's, you know, whatever. I didn't, I didn't do it. It was just an idea, but someone actually had to execute on it. So, uh, you know, get more credit to them. Um, I'm glad to be back again. It's really fun. Uh, again, welcome to those who are, you know, watching online and at home. Um, if you have kids, I understand, okay? It's crazy, okay? And I understand why you might want to stay home. Uh, so all that to be said, we welcome you as well. Um, I, again, just thank you for welcoming me uh, and my family to be able to worship you. I think worship with you. Um, I think, uh, as, as I was thinking about it, I was like, well, I got invited back, you know, it's like, I guess I'm, I was good enough. Um, and it's kind of like how I kind of approached high school. It's like, I kind of was good enough to get through. So, um, anyways, don't be too cool for school, you know, go to school and, you know, get past that. But, um, I'm just glad to kind of be back here, uh, again with you today. So, um, we're going to be in first Samuel three. Uh, I heard, and I was following along, so I'm kind of journeying with you. Um, I was hearing, uh, Pastor Helicon kind of talk about, uh, you know, the judgment and all that stuff, and it's like, wow, this is really harsh, man. Like, uh, I feel kind of bad, you know. Uh, I don't want to do ministry anymore because, you know, everyone's like, you know, everyone's failing, right? So, um, actually, that's part of my story. Uh, when I was uh, first became a Christian, one of the things that happened at, at the churches I, I went to at first was that there was a lot of kind of moral failures. So, it kind of really kind of, um, it was funny because uh, all these, you know, pastors started to leave, and I was like, why are, pe why are these pastors leaving? Like, I don't know, why, why aren't they staying, right? Um, but it was kind of early on in my, in my Christian journey, and it was kind of weird because that was kind of the basis and the foundation of, you know, my, my Christian faith in the beginning was that, hey, not everyone's perfect, right? And it really, dis like, discouraged me not to uh, go into ministry, not to do that stuff. Because I was like, I don't want to be a leader, you know, and, and everyone's going to look at me and kind of expect things of me. I just want to be a drifter and kind of do all that stuff. But again, in God's providence, He kind of uses those things. So today, we're kind of we're going to explore some of that. Uh, how do you actually live in a broken world, imperfect world with imperfect people? And then I think that's kind of a thing that we're always going to be discussing and kind of you know trying to discern in our whole life. Uh, it's not just when we're kids or as we grow up. It's actually still you know to this day, like for people who are older, they're also still dealing with that. How do you deal with imperfection? How do you deal with you know disappointment or expectations that are not met? Um, there's a lot of those questions that, you know, we continue to discern and kind of figure out even as we grow and as we uh, mature, hopefully, in the Lord. So let me pray for us, and then we're going to read in 1 Samuel 3, uh, the whole chapter. And it's not that long, but it's a fun kind of chapter and story. Father God, we ask that you be with us. Uh, again, just to, echo, uh, just to echo the words before uh, in song that the, the battle really belongs to you. We're on our knees, and... Uh, you're fighting our battles for us. We're journeying along with you. Uh, you are our, our Lord. You are our Savior. You're the one who, who guides us. So help us to lean on you and listen to you with eyes 
uh, open and hearts open and, and ears open as well says um, that you know what you need us to hear that your words will not fall flat but that it will do good and, and come and re never return empty so we thank you in Jesus name amen First Samuel 3, a uh, prophetic, prophetic call to Samuel. Maybe that's what you hear in your passage, but I'll tell you what. As I was kind of preparing this message, um, I, was, I was kind of meditating on this. It was hard because it's not so simple, right? I think as, we, as, we, as you continue to read maybe scripture and it's as God kind of speaks to you, you realize you don't know what you think you know. As you read scripture over and over again, you find out different things about it. God speaks to you differently. God, you find details and things that God, you may have missed before. It's not just a, a Bible story you, you kind of heard in, uh, you know, Sunday school or, you know, as a, as a kid. But actually, it's, there's much more depth to it. And I think that's kind of the beauty of God's word as, you know, it could speak to uh, children. But at the same time, it also speaks to those who are more mature, who think they're more mature, to only realize that, hey, we're, st we're still children even as we grow older, we're still children of the, of the Lord. So here's first chapter, uh, first Samuel chapter 3. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli, and word from the Lord was bare in those days. Visions were infrequent. It happened at that time as Eli was lying down in his place. Now his eyesight had begun to grow dim, and he could not see well, and the lamp of the God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. That the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am. Then he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he answered, I did not call, my son. He lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor had the word of the Lord yet been revealed to him. So the Lord called Samuel again for the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. If this sounds like it's repetitive, it is, okay? And here I am, for you called me. Then Eli discerned that the Lord was calling the boy. Verses 9. And Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Then the Lord came and stood and called us at other times. As, as other times. Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. The Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew, because his sons brought a curse on themselves, and he did not rebuke them. Therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So Samuel laid down until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, but Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. He said, what is the word that he spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also, if you hide anything from me of all the words that he spoke to you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Thus Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fail. All Israel from Dan, even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, because the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. This is the word of God. Today's topic, uh, a dim light in a, what, even, even a dim light shines brightly, okay? Um... There's a play, a lot of play on words here, right? There's a light and darkness. Even as uh, Eli was is hearing this, he's he's seeing kind of, he's trying to see, but he says the the light is dim. 
he's getting old, right? There's a sense that your eyesight begins to go. You need glasses, okay? Glasses are an old man's thing, right? You need glasses to be able to see. Your hearing starts to go. You need hearing aids. There is this sense that the light is beginning to go out, and it also mirrors how God, how they're able to, how Israel is, is hearing the Lord as well. They hear kind of dimly. They're not clear as to what the Lord is saying. It says the word was infrequent, right? So imagine this time. Imagine maybe in time of yours, maybe it's currently right now, where you have a dry season where you're not really hearing from the Lord. Or the, what God is saying is you're, you're not really hearing, and it's really infrequent. You're not sure if your prayers are hitting the ceiling and just bouncing off. There's this sense that you're not sure. I'm not sure if I'm really hearing from the Lord. It was during these times. There is a play on words, a, a, a light and a darkness. And we see there's a lot of darkness in Israel at this time. But yet, God's light, even dimly, is still speaking uh, to his people. Uh, especially to Eli, and as we see here in Samuel. So, imperfect people. This is our first slide. Imperfect people in a world mixed in light and dark. Here's the problem of heroes. As we read this, we want to look for heroes. We want to look for leaders. We want people to rise up, to guide us, to give us wisdom, to give us guidance. Yet, we know that even as we're looking at 1 Samuel, we see, you know, in, the, in a world where leadership, we feel like leadership has failed us in a, in a lot of different ways, but we see this problem of heroes. Eli is supposed to be this high priest who is supposed to be the leader of Israel. Yet, it's easy to poke fun of him to say, well, he's not, you know, he's not raising his kids well. He's not rebuking his kids well. And God is judging him for sure. Okay, He is definitely judging him. That's abundantly clear. His house will not continue. Okay, So that's very clear. Justice of the Lord is coming. The problem of heroes, one, is like Eli is not that perfect leader. Yet, God still uses him to instruct Samuel. Samuel is this guy. He doesn't know yet what he's doing. He's just kind of hanging out in the, in the house of the Lord. He was dropped off as a baby, right, by his parents. And he was a miracle child, so they named him Samuel. God heard him. God heard Hannah. That, whole, that beautiful musical song that she sung later, you know, previously in, in the previous chapter. But what they see is that even Samuel, he's in the house of the Lord. You can be in the house of the Lord and not hear from God and or just not know God. This is Samuel. He's being under the tutelage of Eli, who is an imperfect leader. You will look at people around you in your church and you'll say, there are imperfect leaders. And you'll say, well, they should be perfect, right? There is this judgment and this sense. But we live in a world uh, where people are imperfect and a world mixed in light and dark. The problem of heroes is that as we see that, as we look that, we place an expectation on them to be our leaders, to be perfect people. And when they fail us, we fail because our faith fails because we put our faith in those people. And while we should follow, you know, honestly, faithfully, as it says in Romans and, you know, even the, the authorities, we understand that we follow them with a discerning heart and a discerning eye, knowing that they are imperfect, not perfect leaders. But God is still using them for your good. We see that with Eli. Samuel is, hears this from the Lord. He doesn't understand it, right? He calls it three. He, he, God speaks to him so many times. He doesn't understand it. He thinks Eli is calling him. And Eli says, oh, my gosh, like, go back to sleep. Go back to sleep. Go back to sleep. Stop bothering me. By, right? So he finally says, okay, let's try something different. It's not just go back to sleep. But go back to sleep. If the Lord, it seems like if the voice calls you again, it's the Lord. And we talked about what kind of prayers, right, the catechism stuff. This is awesome. I love this because this is, the cat, this is really one of the, the simplest and maybe most profound prayers that we can, any of us can pray when Samuel prays back to God. Have you ever considered that? It's not just him speaking back to God, but it's him actually praying to God, saying, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. If you have nothing to say, you don't know what to say, this is the easiest prayer to say. To say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And you wait, and you wait, and you wait until you hear something 
or he hears something from the Lord. This problem of heroes, we see that even Samuel, the great prophet and the great you know, priest that is to come, he didn't start off perfect. He started off needing tutelage, mentoring, even from an imperfect pastor, an imperfect high priest in Eli. My question, being a cynical person, is, is this going to work? Because Eli obviously failed with his own kids he, they're, and their priests. Why is this going to happen with Samuel? And I have my doubts, right? And we know the whole story, though, you know, so for some reason it, it, it happens and it works. But I would have my doubts going to a failed parent, to a failed pastor. But we know that this is, this is what Scripture is all about. It's saying, do not trust in man. Do not trust even in your own feeling or your own perception. But in an imperfect world, you don't trust in things of this world, but you look heavenward and you say, I trust in what the Lord is doing. This is the problem of sin. The problem of sin is that it infects, it infects everything, even our own perception and our own attitudes and our own uh, you know, feelings in that sense as well. There is nothing that is in this world that is perfect. All is corrupted. And I know the Lord redeems all of that, but we also know that we live in, in a world that is still ruled by Satan, the prince of darkness, that we still are battling and we still are not yet there in perfection. Until we get to that place, there's plenty of work for us to do. This is the problem of sin. It doesn't just infect the world and those leaders, but it actually infects also us. There's inward dwelling sin that impacts our perspective and even how we see things in this way. Here's the problem also, the problem of idealism. And maybe it's a problem of sin, but you know, as we idealize different things and we want to see the perfection, we want things to be purely black and white, we also know that we live in a world where it is not black and white. There is right and wrong, but then there's a lot of in-between where there's called something called process or seasons. There's something called progress, but idealism tells us the problem is that we want everything to be perfect right away, right now, and when it isn't, we're disappointed. This is the problem of idealism in our world, that we cannot see, even in our political system right now, this, this is why it's so hard for people to get along, because we consider each other enemies, when really that idealism is that no, nothing perfect is found in one political party or one, you know, person or, you know, one life circumstance. None of our perfect life exists in this world, but does exist in a person in Jesus Christ. We don't look inward and we don't look at the problems of this world and say, I'm trying to find perfection. It won't be found. But you look towards the scriptures, you look towards the Lord and there you find perfection and the ideal. But we live currently still in a place of sin and brokenness and life in a sinful world. It's an imperfect world in a world mixed with light and dark. The second thing that we want to address is this. How might the Lord uh, speak to us? I think it's timing and repetition. Okay, God speaks to us in meditations and reflection. So as Eli is, is kind of meditating, he's in the house of the Lord, you have to wonder what is he kind of thinking on. He's reading the scriptures, he's studying them, he's meditating on them, but there's failure, obviously, right? And he's teaching Samuel how to do this. And he's reading the scriptures and he's meditating on this all day long. And yet, you can, it's very clear that Samuel doesn't know what he's doing. Just because he's meditating on those things, he has no idea until God lights that fuse. We can prepare all we want. We can be doing all we can. Yet, if the Lord does not, you know, spark that, if we don't invite the Lord into that process, it won't happen. God speaks to us in our meditations and reflections. What is it that we are meditating on? Samuel's in the right spot. He's got advantages, okay? He's in the house of the Lord. Eli's got advantages. His children who are failures, you know, failures, they're going to be judged upon. They had advantages to being in the house of the Lord. Yet, they were not, they failed. Yet, what they meditated on, just because they were in the house of the Lord, this because they were in a position, the, the, the children, okay, the, 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 his sons, just because they were in a, you know, the, the, the house of the Lord in positions of authority, they did not use those things for 
God's good and for the good of all people, right? What is it that you think they were meditating on? They were meditating on food, <laughs> right? We heard last week they were eating. They were eating the fat. They were trying to, uh, trying to use their positions for advantage. What is it that they were meditating on? It surely wasn't the scriptures, even though they were surrounded by it. It's something to reflect on for ourselves. What, it is, what is it that you are meditating on? We always say meditate on the scriptures, meditate on the Lord. But here's a different take on meditation. What is it that dominates your mind and your heart all day long? What do you think about a lot? What do you worry about a lot? That's called meditation. You're actually meditating on those problems or that situation or ruminating on it and kind of discussing it, discussing it in your own head or with others. And that's a meditation. There's nothing wrong with conveying our concerns, confessing our sin, reflecting on our difficulty and things that we're going through and our problems. But there is a point where those conversations and that talk and that reflection and that meditation turns and says, we want, to folk, we want to ask the Lord how to deal with this. There's a time where we cast, right, our concerns to the Lord. Not just hoarding it and our worry, but there's a time where we begin to cast. That's what 1 Peter 4 uh, says, right? We cast our, t- to four. Yeah, he, he, we cast our anxiety unto him who cares for us. What is it that you are meditating on? There are things that we meditate on, even though we say we meditate on Scripture, but is it, do we, do we trust in the promises of the Lord? Do we actually let go and surrender our worry and our desire for control by worrying about it and, and thinking about it all the time? Or is there a time where we actually let go of that and we begin to meditate on the Lord's promises, what He has to say to us? Your reflections and your meditations may not be scripture, may not be good. As you turn your mind and your hearts toward meditating on the Lord, that will change your hearts. The Lord will begin to work on you in this way. And this is where it says, our posture toward God matters. We find in Samuel, he puts himself, he prostrates himself, he says, speak, Lord. He puts himself in a place where he is ready to receive there's a time where we, we, we there's, there's prayers, that, and I'm, I'm guilty of this. There's times where I pray, and all I'm doing is talking. I have relationships like that where all I'm doing is dumping and venting, right? I call it emotionally vomiting, right? Blah, okay? And there's a time and place for that also. But our posture towards the Lord matters to say, I am ready to receive. <laughs> I'm ready to hear what you have to say to me. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. See, even the way that he says it, I am your servant. Eli, in, Eli's instructions are profound. And we see that Samuel follows this beautifully. He puts himself in a position, and he actually honors Eli. He says, I don't know what I'm doing, Eli, please tell me. It's the same language over and over again. Eli, later on in the passage, in the, in the, in the chapter, he says, Tell me what the Lord has said. And actually, Samuel does this. He, 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 he honors it. He puts himself lower in a humble position to actually receive that. This is a beautiful picture of who we are to the Lord. That if we are, call, when we come to him, we say, let me receive, speak so I can receive and hear from you. This is the beginning of wisdom, right? It says, as it says in the scriptures. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. To know that what he says is, you know, what he's speaking to us is priority and paramount. And three, our circumstances are clues to our journey. Something to, to use to discern. If God is beginning to use repetition, right, in Samuel, he, he, God speaks to him three times. He goes to Eli three times. He wakes him up multiple times. If you're having trouble sleeping and you continue to think about something, that may be a clue to your circumstance. God may be speaking to you through your circumstance. Often he does speak to us through our circumstance, trying to shake us of our control or shake us of our our own comfort. Often where we find difficulty is where God is challenging us in our comfort to grow through that struggle. 
Oftentimes we'll pray for that struggle to go away when actually God wants us to go through it. I'll say that again. Oftentimes we will try to pray that struggle away in that circumstance when actually God wants us to go through it. That is the very tool that God uses to refine us, to give us wisdom, to make us more mature. When we begin to shake that comfort in our own control of our own lives to actually rely on him. It's a good question. When was the last time we actually relied on him for our discretion or our decision making or some a choice? Or were we simply guided by what we wanted and what we needed? This goes on and this follows uh, you know, where we want to go next in our terms of our feelings and our process and response. And hoping this is helpful for some of us as we see the scriptures. Our hearts, and then you know, I'm point where I'm pointing this out, our hearts are revealers of who we are, not a reliable guide. Okay, let me say that again. Our hearts are revealers of who we are, not a reliable guide. We see feelings in here, okay? Maybe that, you know, that's not something that I've been starting to pay attention to, the interactions that the people have to the Lord, to one another. We find that, you know, uh, that Samuel's unsure, so he asks Eli. But yet, yeah, there's, a, there's, a scene, there's a scene down here where he's afraid, right? Samuel says he's af- it says that he, Samuel's afraid to tell Eli. There could be many reasons. Eli's unreliable. He's untrustworthy. He's, he's just old. He can't hear me. He, can't, he, do, he doesn't have any more wisdom. He's dumb. There's a lot of reasons why you would not go to Eli. You would not tell him, right? Maybe part of it was because simply... Samuel's a nice guy. He doesn't want to hurt Eli's feelings. This is bad news for Eli. God told Samuel. This is also, there's something also, uh, there's also something, something else in this that's, that's kind of, um, I guess, doubly, uh, uh, it's kind of like God throwing shade, okay? Kind of like, kind of, dis- it's kind of, it can feel discouraging. God speaks to Samuel, a boy who doesn't know him yet, to pass a message to Eli. Eli has not heard from the Lord. This is a time where the visions of God, you know, God speaking to his people were rare. And instead of speaking to the high priest Eli, God chooses to speak to Samuel, a boy who barely knows the Lord at, you know, in any aspect. And then he tells him, hey, you know, Eli, that high priest guy, that, men- that mentor of yours, his house is going to be in ruin. I'm going to destroy him. Ouch. That must be doubly humiliating and embarrassing, right, to Eli, to know that his house is not going to go on. It can't be atoned for by sacrifice, as it says, but also to speak, t- to be spoken to, uh, not n- God not speaking to you, but to you through Samuel, a boy that you are mentoring. That is humiliating to the core. I would feel humiliated, as would you. This feels like it's the wrong way. Yet, let's give credit to Eli here, right? When he de- when he, what he says is, this is good. Let the Lord do <laughs> what he wants. And this starts to create a certain aspect, right? To, ser- to uh, create a certain empathy for Eli. And we have to be careful with our hearts that we're not totally judgmental towards those who are imperfect. Because again, even through imperfect Eli, God does many wonders and continues to help Samuel in this way. Our hearts are revealers of who we are, not a reliable guide. Amidst Samuel being afraid to say these words to Eli, God does something wonderful. Eli doesn't respond, you know, angry or upset. He says, okay. This is the Lord's will. Let it be done. Can you believe that you are still called? And I do believe that Eli was still called to play a role in Samuel's life. Can you believe, right? Do you know, I guess, that you, are, you can still be called? First Peter 2, we are called to be the priesthood of all believers. Do you realize that you're still called even if you are imperfect? Even if you feel like you are unable, even if you feel you are paralyzed by your choices or your life circumstance, 
there are many things where we can be very critical of ourselves that we're disqualified with. When we, when, uh, when, when, when my wife and I, um, when Lori and I first got married and we were in ministry, some, one of the, f- one of the, one of the pervading thoughts for us was like, we, cause we, there's a lot of fights. Okay. I'll, I'll be honest. There's fights. We, we, every, every couple, every married person, we fight. Okay. We may not show it in public. Right. But we do. Okay. And at that time we were fighting a lot. It just felt like fighting a lot and I would go to church right and try to minister to people and I would have to say you know what I don't know if I'm called for this I'm a big failure why would I have why would God use me I feel like I'm disqualified by by ministry you know in ministry because of my failures I felt like Eli I felt like I was not able to do what God did because of my own feelings of self-condemnation Maybe you feel like that. Maybe you feel like me in the sense that I can't volunteer. I don't have time. I don't have energy. I'm not capable. I don't have the the right tools. I'm not ready. I'm not ready for what God has called me to. But the worthiness of the call is not dependent on the person that is called. It is dependent on the one who calls. It is him who calls that makes you worthy. Not you being worthy, then you are called. That's not the way it works. That's not the way grace works, right? Grace is given freely, not because you are deserving of it, but because you are undeserving of it. And if you are in the same way, you know, endowed by grace by the Lord, he saw fit to do that for you. Who are you to say that you are unfit to receive that calling as well? You are called even if you are imperfect. You are called even if you feel uncalled. You are. We are the church. This worry and anxiety, right, uh, are, 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 are just our tempest, our, blah, 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 blah. they are our attempts to control life. We think about it, we decide, we're trying to strategize, we're trying to figure out a solution. But when, like I said, when was the last time when we started to get in that rut of our thought, we actually said, you know, let's cast that anxiety away and let's ask the Lord what he wants us to do. We trust in God's providence and, and we are good stewards of what we are given. Samuel wasn't given much. Eli, even himself, wasn't given much. But in that season... Samuel was given to Eli, and in that moment, in a faithful moment, in a dark world, Eli did right. He said, go and ask the Lord, tell him to, to speak to you. Samuel, not knowing what he was supposed to do, he was impacted and encouraged by this. God spoke to him. He wasn't in charge of much, Samuel, at that point, but just to learn. And maybe that season for you is now, maybe it is just to learn and sit back. It's okay to say, I'm not ready to serve. I'm not ready to help out. Maybe it is your season to rest. Maybe it is your season to receive. And that's true, and that's fine. And trust in that. Have conviction in that, even amidst your feelings of inadequacy and process. Here's some tools for us as we continue, as we think about um, what there, there's other things that we can think about in 1 Samuel 3. There's practical godliness in terms of how we live together. I love this verse. This is, you might have heard of it, Life Together by Diedrich Bonhoeffer. But he, say, he says this. This is where idealism can kill us. God hates visionary dreaming. I love it. <laughs> it makes the dreamer proud and pretentious. The man who fashions a visionary ideal of community, the perfect community, the perfect relationships, demands that it be realized by God, by others, and by himself. He enters the community of Christians with his demands, sets up his own laws, and judges the brethren and God himself accordingly. He stands adamant, a living reproach to all others in the circle of the brethren, brothers. He acts as if he is the creator of the Christian community. He knows all as if his dream binds men together. And here's where reality hits. When things do not go his way or her way, he calls the effort a failure. 
When his ideal picture is destroyed, he sees the community going to smash. So he becomes first an accuser of his brethren. They don't understand. Then an accuser of God. God doesn't understand. He doesn't, he's not doing the right, God's not acting. And finally, this, this despairing accuser of himself. And finally, that despair turns on himself, says, maybe I'm the problem. Idealism can kill us in this way, in the sense that we want things to be perfect right now, right away. If it doesn't, we begin to judge and hurt and slash and destroy the community that God has provided us in. Destroy to destroy the family that we are in. It is like saying, you know, I don't want my family. It's not what God, you know, it's not really what God has for me. Yet I know this is the place that God has me. You are here for a reason. You guys came this Sunday for a reason. There's no accident. You're looking for something. But you're also belonging to something. As imperfect as a community as it is, as imperfect as a person as you are, as imperfect as a pastor or leaders that you follow, this is your family. It is not for you to decide otherwise. <laughs> It is actually God saying, I want you to be part of this family, to grow from it, but also to help it to grow. A couple of things, too, as we you know, get out of here soon, right? The Lord affirms. This is how uh, the Lord might speak to you. The Lord affirms through people, circumstances, and his word. We see that with Samuel, right? Eli affirms it. People begin to notice it. Circumstances begin to follow. In the dim world, he's, you know, Samuel is being spoken to. The, the Lord's words are his words. But then he also meditates on his word. The Lord, as he calls, will affirm you, will affirm your impact to other people. Other people will begin to notice a change in you. And the word will become alive for you as well. God speaks through you to others. And I mean, and, I, and, and you heard that right, speaks through you. People will begin to see that you're different. As you begin to change and mature, God is working in you. You may be completely unaware of how you're changing, and that's probably true because most of the times we're unaware of ourselves. People begin to see, hey, you're changing. You're different. God begins to speak through you to others. Thirdly, God speaks in repetition, as we see in, in the scriptures. Samuel is spoken to many times. Whatever circumstances are being repetitive to, repetitive to you as you re reflect on that, things, the same thoughts over and over again, same things begin to happen to you over and over again. The same scripture keeps popping up over and over again. God is speaking to you. Pay attention to how God is speaking to you in that repetition. We see that in the scriptures. We see repetition again and again. Samuel grew into the Lord. We see that God speaks to Samuel. God speaks to Samuel. God speaks to Samuel. Go to sleep, Samuel. Go to sleep, Samuel. We hear this over and over again. God will speak to you in repetition. Sometimes in words, sometimes in people, sometimes in themes. But he is speaking. He may not speak to you directly all the time. We may not understand but if we begin to hear repetition, 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 it is time for us to stop, meditate, and pay attention to what the Lord has is might be speaking to us. The work done in you is greater than the work done through you. And this is important, right? We want, I, want, I, want, I don't want us to skip through this. The work done in you is greater than the work done through you. As great things happen through Samuel, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to spoil the story as, as we go through Samuel, okay, a little bit. We think, oh, because a leader, we have, if, we have good, if we have good leaders, then the community will become good. Let me spoil the story. Even when Samuel does become the high priest and the leader of Israel, guess what happens a couple of chapters later? You know what they do? They say, we want a real king. Real king? What real king? God is your king. No, 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 we want a king. And this is where Saul comes in. Even amidst great leadership, even amidst God as the king of Israel, God as the leader, with Samuel, a man that is listening to the Lord, his people still stray. 
Good leadership doesn't always equal good people. It helps a lot, for sure. But we have to be aware of the people in our own hearts that we can still stray. We cannot put our faith simply in a person or a leader or even ourselves. We have to be on guard that sin infects all these aspects. Fear and doubt, um, wait, uh, the work done in you is greater than the work done through you. Fear and doubt, even amidst Samuel's doubts about God, about his words, about how we might speak to Eli. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. We think because there's fear, uncertainty, FUD, we call it FUD, right? FUD, when there's FUD in the room, in our, in our minds, in our hearts, all around us, just because those are, things are there does not mean that God is not working. You can be fearful, you can be doubtful, you can be unsure, you can be uncertain, you can be, un- not, you can be very unconfident, yet God will speak even in that. And faith is still possible even in those moments. And I would even gather to say faith is most strong and most bright when there's fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And when there's fear and uncertainty and doubt, it is not for us to just dive in and kind of mull it over and kind of, you know, be afraid. But actually, at that moment is the time where we actually are to step out and listen to the Lord and see where his light is shining. Our world today thinks that to become more enlightened enlightened, and to become smarter and more wise, we are to look inward. We look at our feelings. We look at reflecting on who we are. We want to be the person who we want to be. But the gospel message is that, no, no, no. We look outside of ourselves. We look to Christ, the perfecter of our faith. We see him as perfect amidst this brokenness inside. The one who is the perfect one, the one who we need grace to come from outside of us, That's why it is most helpful, and that's why it is most encouraging that God comes from outside of us. If I were to continue to look, and if we are to continue to look inside, all we're going to find is more problems, more pain, and more feelings of uncertainty. Because in ourselves, we we do not find certainty. We do not find faith. That's why we look outside. And maybe that's why I'm here today as a guest speaker. Maybe it's part of, you know, God's plan that, hey, I'm outside of this circle, this bubble of CFC. Because maybe a fresh voice of a familiar passage will somehow speak life and light into our lives. Here's our last, here's my last encouragement as uh, we kind of end. Even a dim light in a dark world brings much light. You may feel uncertain. You may feel uh, strange. It may seem like, you know what, you know, there's so much darkness around us, too much fear, too much uncertainty, too much doubt. But I'll tell you what, as I was kind of reading this passage, passage and meditating on it, I'm thinking, man, Eli is a, is a disaster. <laughs> Eli, this high priest, is a disaster. But what I was encouraged by, actually, as we finish this chapter, was that even Eli, in his dying end of days, there was a little bit of light. He saw a little bit of it. And he was actually spo- he was, he was able to pass a little bit of that on to Samuel. And amidst his failure... And he's going to be judged, you know, don't worry, okay? He's going to be judged, and, you know, justice will come. But even a dim light shines brightly. And that's encouraging for me. And it should be encouraging for us. That even as you are concerned or not sure about shining your light, or you're not a good light even, like you might say, I'm not a good light. I don't know how to shine my light. Guess what? In a world that is dark, it's full of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Even a little hope, even a little faith, even a little light that you shine. As the priesthood, you are the priesthood. That's the truth. You are the priesthood of all believers. You shine a little light 
And I'll tell you this, maybe you do this later on, you know, when it's dark in the, in the bathroom or something like that. You light a little bit of light, your phone. <laughs> when it's pitch dark and it's a little bit of light, you can see a lot and it shines brightly in the darkness. Let's pray. Father God, help us be encouraged by this. There's much to take in. There's much to digest. But Lord, at the end of this, help us to realize and help us to see with new eyes that you have given us light to follow, that you have called us to be lights in this dark world. Help us to shine brightly or as brightly as we can. That light does not come from us alone, but it comes from you. So as we go, as we live, as we interact, as we rest, as we eat, everything that we do, help us to shine that light as dimly as that is. Help us to shine it because we know that in a dark world, even a little bit of light shines brightly. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, thank you, uh, Pastor Gabe, for um, 